All right, I am going to begin. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last event for the Africa Initiative of this spring semester. Um, today's event is Libya, 10 years after NATO's destruction. Before we begin, I would like to say a couple of things. First is that the Syracuse University College of Arts and Sciences would like to acknowledge with respect to the Onondaga Nation, Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. Next, I'd like to talk about the Africa Initiative. The Africa Initiative of Syracuse University is a campus-wide project housed in the Department of African American Studies within the College of Arts and Sciences. Its purpose is to focus on Africa as an important site of knowledge by highlighting teaching, research, and publication work by Syracuse University scholars in the arts, humanities, social and natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, and others. The initiative aims to revitalize interest in Africa, which has been on the way to many institutions of higher learning since the end of the Cold War. In this respect, it is important to note that the Syracuse University once had a vibrant African studies program, though notable resources accumulated during its existence, such as the East African collection at the Bird Library remain. Moving forward from this history, the Africa Initiative is building upon this previous experience while charting new directions, including offering a significant pool of experts specializing in various aspects of, the, of this diverse and richly endowed continent. The Africa Initiative's presence in the Department of African American Studies reinforces a critical site where most academic work on Africa at Syracuse University is done, and where the continent and the Caribbean are perceived as concomitant parts of the department's Pan-Africanist vision. In bringing together Syracuse University scholars from various disciplines, the Africa Initiative not only promotes interdisciplinary exchange, but also reinforces the university's ongoing efforts to diversify and internationalize the educational experience of our students. As such, the initiative places great emphasis on study abroad programs in Africa, as well as the provision of financial resources to give students exposure to that continent. By providing an alternative vision and platform for, for constructive discourse on Africa and African peoples, the Africa Initiative is helping alter the dominant perception of Africa as a continent ridden with perpetual crises and despair. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's event, Dr. Kofi Apia Uchiri. Dr. Uchiri is the co-director of the Africa Initiative. He is currently the Director of Graduate Accounting Programs at the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. His researchers focus on investors' perceptions of financial disclosure quality, earning risk profiles of multi-divisional corporations, and valuation impact of top executives' ownership and corporate mergers and acquisitions. He is an accomplished business professional who currently serves on leadership committee at the AICPA, including work on financial statements in the courtroom, where they develop training for federal and state court judges on judiciary matters related to corporate financial disclosure and financial reporting regulation. He also serves as director on two corporate boards. His past experience includes public accounting services at Delawatt and RGP. And as a celebrated KPMG scholar, he has helped train over a thousand, over a thousand successful CPAs. He's an active member of the National Association of Corporate Directors, the American Accounting Association, the Institute of Management Accountants, and the AICPA. Dr. Cherry, I relegate it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jordan. And I'm very privileged to moderate this very important session uh, for uh, Africa Initiative. Uh, it's a very, very important topic uh, for all of us. And I hope uh, we have such an opportunity to listen to a couple of wonderful people that have done great research in this area. So we are going to have Professor Campbell present first and uh, Brother Sam will follow. Let me give a brief introduction of Professor Campbell and I'll let him speak for 20 minutes after that. And if you have questions that that come to your mind, please go ahead and put them in the chat room while he's st still speaking. After they both speak, we'll just get to the question and answer format and uh, we will read the questions from the chat room and we will also let people just raise your hands and ask questions at that point. So uh, Professor Campbell, Horace Campbell is an international very well known peace and justice activist. And I have had the privilege to observe him doing all of those things. He holds a joint professorship in the Department of African American Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Political Science at the Maxwell School, both at Syracuse University. So Professor Campbell has published very widely. His most recent book is Global NATO and the Catastrophic Failure in Libya, 
lessons for Africa in the forging of African unity. Now you see why he is really fit to present to us uh, today on this great topic. His well-known book, Rasta and Resistance, from Marcus Gavi to Walter Rodney, uh, published first in 1985, is going through its eighth printing and has been translated into French, Spanish, Turkish, and Italian. He has also authored a revolutionary book, Barack Obama and 21st Century Politics, a revolutionary moment in the USA, which he published in 2010. Uh, Professor Campbell is also the author of Reclaiming Zimbabwe, the exhaustion of patriarchal model of liberation. And he has published more than 100 journal articles and a, do a dozen monographs, as well as chapters in edited books. From 2016 to 2018, he served as the distinguished Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. And in March 2019, he was the keynote speaker at a conference on the 70th, 70th anniversary of NATO held in Frankfurt, Germany by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. I will also say that Professor Campbell is, uh, his most recent publication is entitled The Quagmire of U.S. Militarism in Africa. You need to get that book, please. He's currently writing a book on U.S. militarism and African independence to be published by Monthly Review Press pretty soon. He was one of the four rapporteurs for the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States. That is available. Please join me in welcoming Mualimu Horace Campbell for 20 minutes. Okay, Kofi. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of those who took time to join us in the Africa Initiative mm -hmm. for this discussion on Libya as one of the discussions we're having for the semester. I want to thank Isam, who is um, out there in Illinois. I don't know if it snowed in Illinois like it snowed here in Syracuse, but um, we welcome you. And um, he was going to um, um, be one of the discussions. We had another discussions for today. Maximilian Forty, unfortunately, he could not be here today. Mm -hmm. I am going to raise a number of points, and I would like you to bear with me that um, you can um, send me a signal um, when I have two minutes left, um, brother, um, Kofi, um, and thank you very much for coming forward. Great. I want to raise first three points to say, how can progressive forces hold the United Nations responsible for the destruction of Libya? And how can the progressive and peace forces in Africa, in the United States and all over the world, unleash a new understanding of Western military involvement in Africa? That's the first um, challenge. Second challenge, how is it that the United Nations mission in Libya continues to be complicit with the destruction of Libya. And I'm hoping to answer this in the course of the discussion. And the third question is, how is it that we can hold the US president accountable, that is President Biden and the executive, the Secretary of State, who was one of the cheerleaders in the NATO invasion of Libya in 2011, when resolution 1973 was passed by the Security Council. How can we hold the Karen Bass, the head of the Africa Subcommittee of the House, how could we hold Greg Meeks of the House Foreign Relations Committee, how can we hold them accountable for the destruction? And what I want to introduce in my discussion is what I've been talking about, is the role of foreign capital, especially organs like 
Goldman Sachs and their complicity along with France and Britain with the destruction of Libya. Former President Obama said that the intervention in Libya was the worst mistake of his presidency. If the intervention in Libya was the worst mistake of his presidency, why do we not have a more robust inquiry into the impact of that mistake on the United States society? And why do we not interrogate what is going on in what they call the ceasefire process in Libya today? So that President Trump, while saying that the United States was supporting the United Nations process for peace, he was supporting both sides. That is the government of national unity in, in the government of national accord in Tripoli and the Iftar Alliance forces. The government was supported by Turkey, supported by Qatar, and the Iftar Allied forces supported by Russia, France, Qatar, um, United Arab Emirates, and then other African governments like Sudan and Chad were brought in. In fact, our discussion today cannot go on without underscoring the continued importance of the destruction of Libya in the destabilization of North Africa, West Africa. Some of you heard two days ago that the president of Chad joined the ancestors. The president of Chad, Idris Deby, was one of those African leaders who had aligned with France and NATO to intervene in Libya. And rebels from Chad have been held in southern Libya as part of the Haftar forces, and those rebels were formerly part of the Misrata forces in switch sites. And those rebels are supposed to have launched an attack on Chad last week. And the president of Chad was supposed to be at the front line and he lost his life. This, this story is not entirely credible. And the son of the president of Chad is now become the president of that country. And the point about this mission is that the destruction of Libya and the destabilization of life for the Libyan people has had far reaching repercussions for the peoples of Africa, as we've seen by the outcome in Mali, in Niger, and Chad. And so, after the destruction in 2011 and the wars in 2014, 2019, there was a meeting in Germany on January 20th, January 2020. And this meeting in Germany was called the Berlin Conference on Libya. You can look at the picture. What does the Berlin Conference of Libya in 2020 January 19th have been common with the Berlin Conference of 1884 when Africa was partitioned. In the picture, you will see the president of France, the president of Turkey, the president of Russia, the, pre the, prime, min the prime minister. Um, you, you, you will see Angela Merkel. What I will hope that in the discussion, we will begin to understand why Germany in 2011 opposed the US and the French and British intervention in Libya, 
But in 2020, the Germans are in the lead in trying to salvage the situation in the context of the Berlin Conference. So the outcome of the Berlin Conference involved of a ceasefire, arms embargo, return to the political process, security sector reform, economic and financial reform, respect for international humanitarian law and human rights, and follow up. I must say that for the first time since 2010, the ceasefire has held since November 2020 until today. And there is a process on the way, which I think Isam will say a bit more about, where there should be elections in December 2021. But the ceasefire and arms embargo remains delicate because of all of the international actors and actresses that have been part of the destruction of Libya. For the past 10 years, countries such as Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, France, Britain, the United States have been part of this process of the destruction of Libya. Now, as scholars in the university, we have to ask ourselves, as scholars in the university, how is it that our work and our scholarship reinforce the conditions of exploitation and destruction in Libya? In other words, how is it that what we teach in international relations, in political science, in anthropology, in history, in sociology, in psychology, how is it that the concepts that we use in the university reproduce ideas of inferiorization of Africans and reproduce ideas which justify the destruction of Africa? Well, one of the first things I've always really against is that in the intellectual work, they seek to take Libya out of Africa. And some Libyans themselves internalize this idea that Libya is not part of Africa. And Lib Libya is part of the great history of Africa, which is connected by trade, religion, politics, and history to Africa. So Africans are in something called Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Libyans are in something called North Africa. The other um, idea is that Africans need to be protected. So in international relations, in 2005, after the United States and the West failed to intervene in the Rwanda genocide, they came up with this idea called responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect is an idea that comes from constructivist ideas in international relations which justify Western imperial intervention. Constructivism is a modern form of neoliberal imperialism. And so the literature that you will have on Libya, and I have, I have, I have some of the literature, and I should say Isam, I'm referring to the literature in English because I'm not familiar with the literature in Arabic on, on Libya. And I know some of the literature in French. I'm not familiar with the literature in Italian. As a former Italian colony, I know there is a rich literature. But in this literature in English, we can divide this literature between the old imperial anthropological work of the British, the, the liberal imperialist realist concepts of Africa, and the constructivist. I would say that the other person who was supposed to be here today, Maximilian Forte, um, is one of those writers who was deconstructing imperialist intervention in Libya. And um, the other book I would recommend is by Vijay Prasad, um, Arab Spring and Libyan Winter. Because the intervention in Libya, which was justified in, 19, in, 20, in by resolution 
Res resolution 1973-2011 was justified on the grounds that it was going to protect Libya because the Libyan leadership was about to kill its own people. Three years after this, however, we had the revelation of the email that was sent by President Sarkozy of France, who is now on criminal charges for, Libli for corruption in relationship to Libya. And the email from Sarkozy to Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State of the United States, was the real reason why the West should go into Libya. Number one, the French desire to gain a greater share of Libyan oil production. Number two, to increase French influence in North Africa. Number three, to improve his own internal political situation in France. Number four, provide French military with an opportunity to reassert its position in the world. And number five, address the concern of his advisors over Gaddafi's long-term plans to support France as a dominant power in Francophone Africa. On the last point, I need to add that Pre President Gaddafi had committed Libya to using its resources to anchor the African currency. And in 2001 to 2007, Libya had been at the forefront of promoting monetary union in Africa. So the the, the, the real reasons for the intervention, we now know, is very similar to the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in 1961 and the killing of, um, of Gaddafi, because the Libyan government wanted to use the gold dinar system proposed by Gaddafi so that the Libyan reserves would not be used by Goldman Sachs, but it would support the Africa Term Money of Terror Fund, whose headquarters is in Cameroon, the African Central Bank, and the African Investment Bank. So the real reason for the intervention, that Libya was a threat to the financial security of the West. So the, 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 the operation that was launched in 2001, that went on from March, to October 20th, when Gaddafi was killed, went through many different operational names. The opposition to the Western intervention in Libya came from Africa, came from the African Union. And the African Union called for what has now been called for at the conference in Berlin, immediate cessation. And I should add that the African Union roadmap that was called for in 2011 is still relevant. But Germany, that is seeking to take over from France because the Germans considered the French abandoned in Africa, want to isolate the African Union. And German intellectuals, from the German Institute of International Relations are now trying to catch up with the American intellectuals who are along the same lines of their concerns about, um, about Africa. So uh, let, me, let me underline the position of African intellectuals in their open letter, Libya is an African country. I think this needs to be reasserted because there are some um, of the West earned people who said that Libya is not part of Africa, it's part of the State Department designation of North Africa. And that NATO was involved in a regime change operation. So what is not said in the case of Libya is that there are black skinned Libyans. And at the time of Gaddafi, there were over a million African workers who worked in Libya. And the mobilization of racist ideas against Africans in Libya, especially those who are now trying to escape 
from Africa to Europe through the Mediterranean Sea. We saw this in the Tawerga massacre of Africans in Libya who said that the Africans were mercenaries. So the, 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 the West were very happy with the destruction and the killing of Gaddafi. The um, Secretary of State famously said, we came, we saw, and he died. Now, I should take a minute to say something about the leader of Libya, Gaddafi, who was assassinated. Uh, personally, I am one of those Pan-Africanists who was always opposed to Gaddafi because I remember when Gaddafi supported Idi Amin in Uganda. And I remember Gaddafi making statements that were not healthy for African Union. But it was my view that the West did not have the moral or political authority to intervene in Libya and to assassinate um, Gaddafi. This should have been up to the Libyan people. It should be up to the Libyan people and Africans. So the West called what happened in Libya a success. In my view, what happened in Libya was a failure, and I call it a catastrophic failure. Now, let me move towards my conclusion. The scholarship that comes out of the United States of America has always talked about the transition to democracy in Libya. A transition to democracy which does not include the Libyan people, and a transition to democracy which supports those external forces like Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Egypt, France, that are supporting different militia groups in, in, in Libya. Because if you read the most recent report of the Libya panel of experts, they're still holding on to more than $60 billion of Libyan reserves. Or under the sanctions agreement of the United Nations, they um, are supposed to um, hold the Libyan reserves until there is peace in Libya. So the, the citizens of the United States of America have not been told what was the reason for the killing of Christopher Stevens, the ambassador in Libya in 2012. Christopher Stevens himself was one of those persons who organized factions in Libya for the overthrow of Gaddafi. And so the divisions within the foreign policy establishment in the United States is reflected in the academy in the United States of America. So we, we need to understand the forces that are working in Libya against peace. Now, it seems that the um, United Arab Emirates and um, France and Egypt have agreed to this temporary ceasefire. The Haftar allied forces are allied to very conservative forces. And I hope in the discussion, we will have some more discussion about this. Let me end by saying that the Italian defense minister said that there's no denying that Libya is in this situation because someone put their own interest beyond those of the Libyans and that of Europe. France has a responsibility and we cannot ignore it. That is what the Italian defense minister says. Matteo Salvini, although he's not progressive, I want to quote him because it shows a disagreement within Europe between France and Italy over what's going on in, 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 in Libya. Salvini said, accused France of being responsible for the chaos in Libya. Obviously, someone is behind it. Something like this does not happen by accident. This same someone has endangered for national economic interests the stability of all of North Africa and thus Europe. The point is, 
that the destabilization of Libya, the um, destruction of the society requires far more engagement. President Biden said that the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan. But in saying that the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan, some of the foreign policy establishments said they're going to turn their attention to Africa. I believe that as Africans, we must oppose this statement and position of the foreign policy establishment because it is an excuse for intensified U.S. military engagement with Africa. I will stop there and then I will um, yield to my colleague Issa. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Campbell, for the great insights. And just before I invite the second presenter to come in, I just want to remind everyone that as we make progress tonight, just go ahead and put your questions in the chat room. Then Professor Campbell can begin to consider them. And when uh, Sam is done, he will also look at those questions. And we want you to put those questions here before you forget them. But at the same time, at the end, if you have a question that you just want to verbalize, we will allow that. So our second presenter is Issam El Khorli. He left Libya in 2012 to study in Norway for two years. Following that, he attended St. Olaf College in Minnesota to pursue a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. Uh, Norwegian studies and teacher education. In 2020, he finished his Master of Arts from Scandinavian Studies Department at the University of Washington uh, with a thesis focusing on the impact of neoliberal globalization on Norway's teacher education. Currently, he is a PhD student at the University of Illinois researching Libya's education history and how citizenship development has been influenced by the rulers of the state from independence, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from independence through Gaddafi's shifting ideologies, pan-Arabism, pan-Islamism, pan-Africanism, and now under the pro west Muslim Brotherhood leaning rulers. So please join me in welcoming Sam to our virtual stage for his insights on Libya 10 years after NATO's destruction. Thank you, um, just generally thank you everyone from the Africa Initiative and also everyone uh, who organized this event at Syracuse University. Um, as a Libyan, and I think all Libyans would agree with this, there is a connection between Libya and Syracuse University that was led by the uh, Lockerbie bombing and the allegations against Libya in 1988, which has led to the sanctions against Gaddafi and the Libyan people for many, many years, and uh, the rest was history. But uh, there were a lot of students flying back from West Germany to the United States where the bomb was uh, well, was uh, was blown up in the plane. And so there is that forced connection between Libya and uh, Syracuse University. Um, so I pedagogically, I like to do just this quick overview of what I will be discussing or just brush uh, bri uh, briefly brushing over. And that's, I will kind of, uh, just to kind of situate the history of Libya uh, because it's so murky, it's so, um, it's so divided, so polarized that if you ask me and ask any other Libyan, they would almost tell you a different story. And so I think there is a need for what is commonly called the process of articulation. So I'll articulate the past 10 years very briefly. And then I'm gonna go straight to what has led the country to be in such a situation where, you know, the loss of Libyan, Libya's agency, the loss of sovereignty, and just everything is coming from abroad. Um, and, and, and so uh, this is kind of the map of Libya. And I think what uh, Professor Campbell just uh, spoke about what was you know, very well spoken. You have uh, the people in, in the Libyan National Army in East Libya with uh, General Khalifa Haftar, and then you have the government of national accord in the West uh, Western Libya, and that's supported by Qatar, Britain, uh, Turkey, and uh, Italy, and recognized by the United States in the East, you have the House of Representatives, which was elected by Libyans in 2014, and that was the last elections that Libya has had since. 
Um, and and uh, in um, 2019, 4th of April, because of the division East-West and the control of the Libya's institutions, such as the Central Bank, um, uh, the Libya Central Bank and the, for, uh, the foreign reserves, uh, the Libyan Investment Authority being centralized in Tripoli. Um, a lot of the distribution of resources was you know, diminished for the rest of the country because if you were to give money to the Eastern government, that means they're gonna use it for the military and the military would eventually attack Tripoli, which what actually eventually happened. They did not give money to the East, they did not give money to the South and the Libyan National Army attacked Tripoli on the 4th of uh, April 2019 with the hope of you know, getting rid of uh, Muslim leaning uh, or Islamic leaning factions that control the capital. Um, and also note that in um, I created this timeline to go over detail, but I, I think um, Professor Campbell did such a good job at it. Uh, the, the AFRICOM intervened in Libya officially as an AFRICOM was in 2016 when the, uh, when the government of national accord, they, they, need, they were lacking legitimacy from the Libyan people. And so they were trying to liberate the city of Sirte in 2016 in May and they from the Islamic State. Um, and they were not able to do it for three months. And then the, they asked the AFRICOM to actually start operations there. And that's uh, since then the AFRICOM's operations in Libya, even though the city is liberated from the Islamic State, they have not left the country. And uh, we also saw that the Libyan National Army uh, using Russian weaponry, uh, shot down one of the uh, AFRICOM's airplanes uh, while flying over Tripoli in 2019. And so this kind of goes with the, the common joke of like, once they, they come, they never go. And that's actually the case with the AFRICOM. Um, and so, uh, the, and that led to the government of national accord at the time to also sign deals with Turkey and the redrawing of borders, the maritime borders, where Turkey is going to be, you know, exploring gas resources in eastern Libya, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, and then also going to support the government of national accord to defend itself from Tripoli, in Tripoli from uh, uh, Haftar's forces. Eventually, uh, Haftar retre re retracted or traced all the way back to Sirte, the center of Libya in the middle right here and uh, what that has led to you know um kind of egypt being fearful of the expansion of the muslim brotherhood to intervene in libya and they told uh, uh turkey and the uh, government of national accord so it is a red line if it's crossed egypt will intervene and so again different countries deciding libya's future um, and so now we have kind of a political stalemate and we have a military stalemate and that has led also to the united nations uh special mission to uh, Lib in libya Ghassan salama to quit uh, his position and then there was a stephanie williams who took that position but also note that everybody martin kobler and nadine leon and Ghassan salama they all have gone through the same countries and uh, and reproduced the same destruction and that's uh, iraq and afghanistan Done. They have all served there as United Nations missions. So I feel like there's this reproduction, this replication of chaos across the world. Um, but then, so that's kind of on a political uh, struggle level, right? But then there's the ceasefire that happened because of Egypt said, this is the red line. What that led to the, the there was lifestyle wise. So my family, my relatives, my friends, they were going through, you know, power cuts for 20 hours a day, sometimes two days during Ramadan, during the summer last year. Uh, and then you see politicians taking pictures abroad and traveling somewhere, you know, in Europe and uh, Asia and so on. And then there's also absence of liquidity from banks. Meanwhile, mercenaries, they receive $2,000 per day, uh, per month uh, for their services in protecting the governments and their forces. Um, and there's shortage of gas in a country that's extremely wealthy of gas, extremely wealthy of resources, just broadly. And, uh, and then the militias, they, they smuggle subsidized gas to neighboring countries. And so all of these problems has led to, um, you know, a eruption or the what's the con conjuncture in a way, uh, where eruption of youth protests in Sebhan Sirt in early August, 2020. Um, and then they called the uprising of 2011, the destitution. It's not like a liberation or democratization of Libya, they call it destitution. But then I, as you, if you know Libya's geography and the culture, those two cities, Sabha and Sirte, they have commonly, 
protested for Gaddafi's regime. And so they also went out in the streets carrying the green flag, Gaddafi's poster and Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, which I'll speak about later. And what that led to, to governments saying, oh, these are just, you know, loyalists who are nostalgic. But then surprisingly, the, 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 these protests, they actually broke out in the rest of Libya. And as you know, Libya, 97% of it, it lives on the coastline. And so there were protest anti-government protests in the East and the West. And that, you know, um, and then also the youth movement in the 23rd of August took down the streets in Tripoli, demanding the removal of uh, Savage, the prime minister. Um, and so he said that he will re resign, but then, you know, the, so he responded to the demands of the Libyan people, the youth in the street, but then you have also the foreign meddlers. So it's kind of like there is something that Libyans want and it is something that foreign meddlers want. And so this is Tiffany Williams, a little bit background about her. She has served as the, as the uh, chief of mission, US chief of mission in Bahrain from 2010, 2013. And, you know, just like uh, the, the wonderful Hillary Clinton emails that anybody could access, thanks to Julian Assange's work on WikiLeaks, you notice that she remained very quiet when, the, when the, there were violent attacks by the government forces against the protesters in Bahrain. She was completely silent, just based on words from you know, Hillary Clinton's emails. And, and so that tells you also about this imperialism that we should also be cognizant of that human rights, you know, they're not often prioritized by those who are, who are perceived to be moralizing all the time, Western imperialism, that is. Um, she said on the resignation that Savage should not resign until we choose, like the Libyan political dialogue forum chooses the next authority, right? And so again, uh, there was peace. There was, you know, the, the the international community agreed that Libya, you know, there were they weren't fighting, you know, as we also notice right now, Turkey and Egypt are kind of having a little bit of rapprochement. It hasn't been finalized yet. You have the Qatar and UAE and Saudi Arabia. They had the deal in uh, in uh, in January, um, and so there is the global agreement that Libya right now, for some reason, needs to be, you know, we need to stop meddling in it. And also we noticed that the new authority traveled to all of those countries who were used to support the, 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 the deferring uh, fighting uh, factions in Libya. Um, and so one has to ask, you know, this Libyan political dialogue forum that was, you know, initiated by the United Nations, you know, who chose these 75 people, you know, when um, once I was writing an article that got rejected from counterpunch in uh, Jacobin, I looked at the backgrounds of these uh, people and, and then you notice that 36 of them affiliate with the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam. And then there's also uh, controversial figures, you know, like Abdurrahman Swahli on the left, once blacklisted by the EU for supporting terrorist factions in Libya. Nizar Kawan supported Eastern Islamic State and also the destruction of the Libyan International Airport in 2014. And then Ali Beiba, um, money laundering in Scotland. Uh, he has a red notice from the Interpol in 2014 and also financial corruption because he used to work for the Libyan state during the time and he has billions. And also a lot of people accuse him of actually meddling in this Libyan political dialogue forum. But some results did come to fruition. There is a sustained pe uh, ceasefire. And I think it's very important to note that it is, you know, it's absence of war, it's not peace. Um, and that's just a big distinction, a piece, you know, that you don't intend to start war, but then there's just people are holding their guns, they're not shooting at each other. And I think this is what's happening in Libya. Um, and then this 5-5 is a commission of five military leaders from the east, uh, from Haftar's army, and then the west from, you know, the Tripoli uh, faction. Um, and this has led the political uh, dialogue forum to government of unity and uh, national unity, and then also presidency council representing three of Libya's regions from the colonial era, the Fizan, Serenaqa, and Tripolitania. Um, and then we will be having elections in December. And the one on the right is Abdel Hamid Dbeib, and he comes from the city of Musarata in Western Libya, and then the presidency council in front of the painting, USS Philadelphia. <laughs> um, Mohammed El Menfi, uh, he's from Tobruk. What the Libyan political dialogue forum has done so well is playing with identity politics. Um, they said that we're going to have people represented from every region from the country, and they completely neglected the idea that you can be from a certain region without really espousing to the ideologies of that region. I think this is an example of Mohammed al Menfi because he was the, the Libya's um, uh, ambassador to Greece in 2018. Uh, 19, and then when the signing of the, the agreement with Turkey, which really harmed 
Greece's national maritime borders. Um, he did not go against it. He was actually in support of it. And then Greece kicked him out uh, from the mission. And so even though he's from the East, he does not really espouse to the values, uh, not necessarily the values, to the political ideologies of the Eastern part of the country. And so a, a lot of people, they say, oh, no, you're being well represented, but it's not uh, a reality. Um, so there is this hopefulness there is this aspiration that right now libya is going into a specific path you know where we're going to be having elections in the future but i think we have to look at the reality what it actually exists you know libya still functions under the chapter 7 al bin the saba on the united nations means that you know allow foreign intervention to protect at any point especially articles 41 and 42 what that means is that any country that sees that civilians are under threat um, they are, they have the, the, the Security Council has the last say and they can intervene in Libya. And so uh, let's say Turkey sees that the government of national accord is under threat, civilians are under threat, they are coming there to protect. And I think also Professor Campbell highlighted that as well, the, the responsibility to protect. Um, and then there's also the absence of self-determination that we Libyans, we, uh, we have created a draft of the constitution and we have created the election law, right? But then that's available. And then there's also um, the Libyan political dialogue forum, which is chosen by the United Nations. No Libyan had a say in who is on that 75 person list. They're writing the election law. Recently, they're realizing that Saif al-Islam and Khalifa Hafta, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, Gaddafi's son, they have a massive popularity in Libya because a lot of people are nostalgic for the safety and the economic prosperity before 10 years. And they're, so they're saying, they're suggesting that the elections should be based on party system, that you, people choose the parties and then the, the representatives of those parties, they get to choose a president instead of directly choosing a president. And in a study in 2012 by Oxford University and, um, and the University of Benghazi, uh, they surveyed roughly 30,000 Libyans and asked them, what do you aspire to see in Libya after the toppling of Gaddafi? And they said that we want just to choose one president, we don't really care about parties and so on. So it's kind of a similar system to what we had before, it's just that the president of the country changes. They don't care about parties. And I think this is where it's very interesting that the current, they are just very afraid that after 10 years, now a decade, we still, you know, are reminiscent of the old regime and they're trying to do everything to, to prevent them from happening because there is actually a law even in Libya to prevent the old regime from forming a political party specifically to them. Um, and so there's this kind of, again, cancel culture that's happening there too. Um, and there's also absence rule of law. This is uh, Bija. He controls the maritime, you know, the flow of migrants and so on. But he also smuggles them at the same time. And this is a screenshot from, you know, uh, HBO, um, uh, yeah, HBO documentary on Libya. And then he spoke about beatings. You know, I only beat them if they're fighting. And he's talking about black migrant workers again who were trying to flee Libya for racism, for you know, be uh, better life chances in Europe and so on. Um, and then there's this rule of militias where this one, this person, you know, Mohammed al fal uh, from being wanted for supporting terrorism to receiving a medal of honor from the presidency council in Tripoli. And so the security situation, you know, you legitimize the existence of militias by giving them awards, by giving them paychecks and being unable to even, you know, put them in jail. And then also you have politicized rule of law, the, uh, the death penalty to Hamis Gaddafi's driver, so Mohammed Salim al Mahjoub. His only crime was to be the chauffeur, the driver of, uh, on the left is Hamis Gaddafi, so Gaddafi's son. Uh, he's dead, but then the one got the death penalty. Nobody had an uproar, nobody contested it. But then when we see death penalty to Benghazi's terrorist by the name of Mohammed Rati Nafal, Tripoli Courts of Appeals issued that. Um, the judge, al Busefi fled Tripoli because the Muslim Brotherhood declared the judge as a legitimate target. And so again, death penalty on the ex-regime is fine because we don't care about it. But then uh, a, a person who is, you know, a, who fought against Hafta, who fought against the Libyan National Army or whatever, you know, they are the ones that we should protect. And so again, politicized rule of law. Um, and then there's a, this symbolic reconciliation where you see pictures and smiles and happiness, you know, between politicians, but then Tawarra is still a question. The people, you know, are still 
not able to go back fully to the to the town. You know, and he also noticed that the town sign, you know, crossed off instead of saying Tawarat says the neighboring town, Musarata. You know, the coastal road is still blocked between the east and the west. So there is no so one has to go through the south and go back to the north. Even though that there is a movement by actually some women right now trying to negotiate between the fighting factions. And I think that's that will yield some positive uh, progress. And then also anti-blackness and fear of what's going on in Chad, especially the borders have been, you know, uh, going uh, people, you, you could just cross the border very easily for the past 10 years from the south, but just because of there is an eruption of violence in Chad right now. Oh, we need to protect the border because of you know immigrants or crime or and so on and so on. And again, uh, this is what also Professor Campbell spoke about. We Libyans tend to pretend that we are North Africans, which is very different from um, the so-called Sub-Sahara, which is a problematic term in itself. And then there's also the dwindling of the state, where right now the new government is suggesting, you know, neoliberal austerity, you know, removing oil subsidies, and then they are giving letters of credit to a private sector instead of providing the, the services and providing the, the goods that Libyans need in, you know, in, in without profit or very minimal profit, they are allowing the private sector to prosper. And that has, you know, uh, increased prices drastically and caused drastic inflation because of corruption. And then there's also decreasing investments, seizing of investments from the Libyan Investment Authority in the continent. Everybody's focusing on Europe, 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 and then the, the mercenaries that were brought in by uh, UAE, by Russia, by uh, Turkey, they, we still cannot oust them from the country. And so, um, and then there's also obliteration of self-worth. The government of national unity signs a deal with Turkey for construction of power plant, even though Libya has plenty, some of them are just dysfunctional. Um, and then you read this says on the website says job opening stated anyone can apply except Libyans. Um, and similar to fascist Italy's rule, when I'm seeing some pictures from 100 years ago, it says no dogs or Libyans allowed. It is the exact same thing. Everybody can apply except Libyans. Um, and so what kind of what kind of, you know, self worth does that, you know, in state in Libyans currently? with the new government and then uh, no politician no politicians since the past 10 years have opened the file to the case of nato killing 370 individuals in 2011 when they intervened to protect civilians right so nobody opens that case um, and so my conclusion is very briefly, I know I'm closing a lot of time, is like Libya, just like Iraq had the debatification, de there's the de-socialization, meaning socialism that Libya had, the, the socialist ideals, the anti-imperialism, and so on. That has been, you know, everything has been removed. And you see, you know, the Ghazal fountain in Tripoli being demolished just because it has a naked woman. And that's kind of a sign of, you know, nudity, it's haram, you know. And then the statue of Jamal Abdel Nasser in Benghazi, was taken down, you know, and so there's this demolishment of collective memory, like Libya was part of the Pan-Arab project, you know, and so you try to liberate that. And so this is the statue being destroyed, street names like Jamal Abdel Nasser and Thomas Sankara, they are from Burkina Faso, you know, are being renamed for some uh, something else like Independence Street and so on. Um, and then also in the education system, there is nothing mentioned, the history stops at 1969, and there's nothing mentioned about the Pan-Arab movement, about uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, Michel Aflaq, or uh, you know, any of the key figures. But because of this rapprochement with the West and this re-Europeanization of Libya, we noticed that they, they're planning to start teaching Italian in school again, because we are part, we, we have good relations with Italy. Um, and then they also removed national liberation movements from the curriculum because of COVID. And they also removed Hegel and Marx and Plato from political theory classes. And so there is all of this intention to kind of de make people think less and less and less critically about these global political problems. Antonia Gramsci said this quote, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. And I think this is the exact situation that Libya is in right now, that people are reminiscing for the old, but then, you know, it's, uh, it's dead. And, and then the new cannot be born because it, it's, try to, it's trying to, to kind of 
re-Europeanize itself and not trying to think of its identity, think of its collective history, think of its collective struggle like it did with the rest of the African country. And that is a history of colonialism. And I end with this quote by Kwame Nkrumah when he talks about colonialism is the aspect of imperialism, which in a territory with an alien government, that government controls the social, economic, and political life of the people it governs. Yes, and so this is my ending. I know my, I think I paused a bit, but I, I will just stop here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both so very much. Uh, you have kept within the time and we have quite a bit of extra time. So uh, we'll be able to get deeper into the questions. Now, I just wanna mention to both of you, uh, our wonderful presenters, that there is a couple of questions in the chat room. You can look at it, and if you just want me to read that, uh, I would do so. But take a good look at those questions, and please jump in as the questions come. And you are both experts on Libya, so please just feel free to ask. Well, I, I, I would prefer if you read the questions for us, because we did not see all of them. All right. So, I so, show and you. then others can raise their hand. And they're coming in. Can either of you talk about who controls Libyan oil and gas today? Isa. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons that um, Libyan National Army in East of Libya attacked Tripoli was that the Libyan National Army controls all of the refineries, controls all of them, but the as it's being sold or produced and sold, the money goes to the Central Bank of Libya. And that is controlled by the government in Tripoli. And, that, and then the money goes to only stays in Tripoli or the area surrounding it, and that's it. So, but that was 2019. Right now, they're controlled, you know, by the government of national unity. Um, and so right now, um, for example, in the month of March, the, the oil revenues, uh, sorry, profits was uh, $5 billion dollars. Um, just this month, March. We also noticed that the price, uh, the oil prices went up in March. So I think hopefully that answers the question. Yes, yeah. I, I would add that one of the factors of the negotiations is about who will control these three main institutions in Libya. The Libyan Investment Authority, the National Oil Company of Libya, and the Libyan Investment Authority. In fact, a lot of the war were over those three institutions. And I think what those of us who are on the outside must continue to do is to say that these institutions should be in the hands of the Libyan people and the resources of these institutions should serve the Libyan people for electricity, water, housing, and reconstruction. In other words, we should be raising the question of what the reconstruction would look like. Because from the presentation that we have seen, the monies in Libya are to be divided between some of the same elements that were involved in the past 10 to 15 years in Libya. So I, I think one of the reasons for the African Initiative is for us to raise new questions about the political and economic dimensions of countries like Libya. That's excellent. Let me go ahead and throw in the next question because it's in some way related to that first from Jacob Jefferson. I would like to know about, I would like to know more about the Libyan reserves that are being withheld. Who is holding them and what are the conditions for their return? Okay. Well, I, I will take a start, Isam, and then you can come in. Under the sanctions regime, of Resolution 1973 of the United Nations in 2011, Libya was sanctioned and Libyan reserves were seized and they're held mostly in the United States, in Britain, in France and Switzerland. Now there's an indeterminate amount, but we know that there's something like $200 billion we're talking about. Now, in the last report of the panel of experts of the United Nations for Libya, we know that although the money 
is under sanctions. The Libyan Investment Authority has been trading that money on the international stock market. Mm -hmm. So the Libyan Investment Authority itself has something like $20 billion on the management. So it's a, it's a management situation with finance capital. The only people they do not want that money to be in the hands of are the Libyan people for water, electricity, and housing. As long as it can be sanctioned, it can be in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York to support the US dollar, but not in Libya for the Libyan people. I don't know if Issa wants to add anything there. Yeah. Um, yes, so that's uh, that's what I actually wanted to say as well. Uh, the, okay. I think uh, what's... Um, the money also exists in South Africa, I believe, too, a big, big, big portion of it, uh, especially from the time of uh, President Zuma. And um, Gaddafi was framed in 2011 to have um, have all of those, all that money in his name, but it was actually in uh, Libya's name. But, uh, but yeah, and so Libya, just like I said, is under the charter, uh, you know, the United Nations Charter, uh, Chapter 7, that's uh, that says that because it is a place where it's unsafe it is unstable um it, it cannot use that that amount of money to you know uh for any form of development of any form of you know establishing any project in libya and so any money that libya needs from it has to sell oil um and to get money in return so it cannot use any of its reserves and and the issue with that even when it comes to international transactions because of the sanctions on libya it cannot even engage in a lot of the <clears throat> international uh deals especially when it comes to uh uh to um what's it called in english uh the the harbors yeah, the harbors, pretty much. So, for example, I give you uh, in UAE recently, um, or the, for the past five years since it declared war on Yemen, they have been controlling a lot of the the harbors, the the places where ships, you know, dock, and um, and they have actually closed Ras Lanouf, and this is one of the biggest uh, biggest harbors in the center of Libya, and and, and known to be producing oil and so on. Bec they have closed it in the sense of creating. An, an economic deal with some militia men to close it, and and what has happened afterwards? They uh, the Libyan state, the House of Representatives, even though they are supporting the United Arab Emirates and they are supporting one another technically, they have filed a lawsuit against UAE because UAE right now is trying to monopolize Libya's uh, or not even monopolize to kind of make them dysfunctional intentionally. The UAE said this lawsuit, we cannot even engage with it because the House of Representatives is not the official government, right? It's not the legitimate government. It does not have control over the assets. Uh, it has no control over the money. We cannot engage with it. It's just it's a bunch of you know politicians as if they're controlling the local level. And so there is this intentional destruction of Libya that is meant to kind of being reproduced in order to you know, monopolize. And we also know that, you know, harbors, they are the way to actually transport goods and services, like we learned from the Suez Canal incident, right? Could I add one point to this? Oh. The UAE is using the precedent that was set by Goldman Sachs uh -huh. in the court case of the Libyan Investment Authority in London in 2014 when Hiftar launched the war in 2014, the Goldman Sachs said they did not have a case to answer for because there's no legitimate government. And so we are seeing the same playbook by the UAE, which is supported by very conservative forces in Israel and the United States of America, and by the Trump forces in the United States of America. Great, anyone wants to comment further on that question? So, Brother Sam, you mentioned there are women mobilizing to negotiate between different forces in Libya. Do you want to tell us a little more about that, please? Yeah, um, so this is very, very recent. So like three days or two days ago, um, as you know, the Libya's coast is roughly you know, 2,000 kilometers and a lot of people travel with car. But because of the, 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 the red line that was drawn uh, in Sirte, 
you know, there is peace processes going on there. There's the five plus five commission from both military factions, but it's very securitized, very, very militarized region. And so civilians, they cannot cross that area, but that kind of incurs a lot of costs and transportation and also people who want to travel, especially with shortage of gas and things like that. And so the politicians for the past, you know, uh, six months, they weren't able to, uh, politicians by that, I mean, mostly men, I think all of them are, no, actually all of the military men and, you know, men. Um, very egoistic, they have this maximalist, uh, you have to do X, Y, and Z, all of them in order to get uh, things done. Uh, there's lack of negotiation happening uh, between them uh, in order to open the, the coastal road. And so uh, there are women from actually Tawarra, uh, the, the city with predominantly black people. Um, and then there's women from Tripoli and women from the East who are actually created a commission to negotiate as well and trying to reduce this maximalist, you know, egocentric, uh, you know, demands to, you know, political fulfillment. Um, and uh, we, we have to wait and see what the results will be. But um, in the South, in Murzug, once there was tribal fightings in 2017, and, you know, the, the, the tribes, they're all men, you know, they tried to solve it. But then, um, I know this sounds kind of like simplistic, but then the women actually sat down and they invited each other for extended lunch for like three days in the town of Murzug. And, you know, and then they solved the problems and the war was over between the, the fighting factions. And so women do have a role. It just often be unnoticed because it does not appear. It's too complicated for Western media to understand the tribal system that we do have in Libya. Yeah, Mahi, I think that's a satisfactory answer, right? Great. It was a very deep uh, thought. Now, as we wait for a few more questions to come in, either of you, and I guess I will let both of you do that <laughs> if you want to, if there were certain things you really wish you could have said, but you were sort of constrained by time, so you didn't say those things, we still have a little bit of time. Just go ahead and hit it as you wish. Well, um, the, the one point I wanted to underline mm -hmm. was about the Berlin Conference. And I think Isam um, came back to this in terms of the negotiations, the way in which negotiations exclude the Libyan people, and that the whole ceasefire arrangement is to ensure that the Libyan people are not part of it, that it is an arrangement to fix political actors, political financiers, in other words, political careerists who made money in Libya. And so this Turkey and Egypt, um, Qatar, UAE, Germany, France, and that the president, the, 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 the chancellor of Germany um, came in to try to resolve this situation because the French has messed it up so much. Mm -hmm. And the United Nations is going along with a process which seeks to marginalize the Libyan people and marginalize African people. That is one thing I would have wanted to be more, more strong. That's great. The one, the thing that I would like to kind of touch upon again, I wish if Maximilian Forti was here, but it's the, the, the idea that Libya is uh, white or people of, of Libya look like me, right? Um, and that is, you know, 60% or so of Libyans, they're darker skin, black, um, and so on. Um, and what has that led to since 2011 is that there has been discrediting of Africa as, you know, a continent worthy of listening to or learning anything from. And this is what I submitted an article, I hope that you published, it's called the De-Africanization and Re-Europeanization of Libya. And what it, it really states is that the, the Libya is not listening to the African Union anymore. They're not thinking about anything that comes from Africa, that even education policies, they instead of learning with reconciliations, what happened in Rwanda um, and uh, what's happening in Congo when it comes to education as a tool for peace building, they are saying, no, we need to learn from Italy, we need to learn from Europe. Um, and then there's uh, this introduction of, you know, Western values and education system instead of thinking, you know, indigenous knowledge or even anything about Africa as a continent. 
Um, and and then the big, big thing is that uh, me and Professor Campbell spoke about in late December was, you know, this, the, the Gaddafi had a plan to create a canal in the center of Libya. And that is uh, in Sirt. Sirt is below sea level as a, as a city. And then if one digs a canal, it would actually reach, you know, Mediterranean waters to Central Africa. And that would change the dynamics quite drastically when it comes to transportation, to global, you know, uh, global trade and so on. And so all of these things, they have been canceled out because Gaddafi tried to um, develop them. Uh, they have been, you know, uh, Gaddafi did, you know, uh, for example, this whole idea even about the, the RASCOM satellite that Libya bought or financed so Africa does not, uh, the continent does not have to pay money to Europe. Um, every year and take loans from the IMF and the World Bank and pay it with twice and three times more. Um, all of these things, they have been canceled out because they are Gaddafi's ideas and so on. And they don't understand, unfortunately, there isn't that much of political awareness that it was the, all of these things are anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, anti-underdevelopment of Africa, um, broadly speaking. So, yeah, that's what yes, I would um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the place of Saif al-Islam in the elections and what are the machinations about Saif al-Islam and what, what, how much support does he have um, um, among Libyan youths? Um, so if you have the map of Libya, he was, uh, he's in the Western part of Libya uh, in the mountains. Nobody knows where he is. He has spokespeople that come and speak once every six months. Um, he, um, Hafta, actually, uh, two weeks ago, his son uh, paid somebody $30 million to assassinate Saif al-Islam. Because Hafta... Um, could, you repeat, could you repeat that? I'm yes. Sorry, this is news. Yes, uh, so uh, roughly a couple, uh, two weeks ago, Hafta and, uh, Hafta and his son, Saddam, they paid uh, somebody roughly $30 million uh, Libyan dinars to assassinate uh, Saif al-Islam because the biggest threat, so the biggest potent figure in Libya right now is Saif al-Islam because people are so nostalgic for the regime and they want anybody from the old regime. Um, and uh, so not everybody wants that, obviously. Um, the current people who are in government, they don't want that. But then a lot of youth, a lot of you know people nostalgic, they want the old regime. But then they realized that if Saif al-Islam was there, the chances of Haftar or somebody who's military, you know, charismatic, like Sisi in Egypt, um, would be dwindling if there is Saif al-Islam. So there has been assassination attempts um, against uh, Saif al-Islam, Gaddafi. Um, yeah, so that's the situation. But then he has promised in 2018, he said the first time that Libya is going to have an elections, he will run. Um, but again, I am hesitant that he will be um, you know the um, anti-imperialist because he is educated in the West. He is the one that brought the neoliberals in 2007 and eight and nine that actually allowed Libya to, you know, the CIA to meddle in it as much as it wanted, allowed the MI6 from the UK to do as much work in Libya as they wanted. So he, he is not as revolutionary as we would have wanted him to be for Africa, just broadly speaking. So, yeah. Thank you. Great, great, great questions. I got a couple more questions. I think I'm going to put both questions out there so you don't run away without addressing both. How's that? Uh, one is on climate, the other is on sentiment uh, that the folks have here. So the first question from Zachary is that there are talks about climate change and reduction of carbon emissions. How does this shift affect Libya? And the second question, let me go ahead and add that now. What is the general view of Gaddafi today in Libya? Oh, let, let me try the first one. And then I, I could not speak about the general view of Gaddafi because I'm not in Libya. But um, to the first question, the Libya had this project called the Great Man-Made River mm -hmm. that Libya is sitting on an ocean of water. Under the desert in Libya, there is some of the cleanest water in the world. Hmm. And this is all under the Sahara. And Libya had built what they call the Great Man-Made River, and it was going to be connected with a water transfer system from the Congo 
to Lake Chad. So there was going to be a transportation and water system route to all of Africa. No, this great man-made river was linked up to the great green wall of Africa. The great green wall of Africa is to plant seven, to plant more than a billion trees across 7,000 kilometers in the Sahara region of Africa. So the, the African Union, the Lake Chad Basin Commission and Libya were involved in discussions about how to rise above global warming in Africa. And there are still hydrologists and technicians in Libya who are still working on this matter. In fact, at the Lake Chad conference in Abuja in 2018, I sat behind a, beside a Libyan water engineer. And this Libyan water engineer had come to the conference because the Libyan technicians and technocrats are still interested in collaboration in water transfer with Africa. That's great. Sam, you have something to add to that? No, and so, um, yeah, uh, I actually did not know about that. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Campbell, for, you know, um, you can follow only so, so much about Libya, but yeah, no, this is fascinating. Um, the debate is, um, if you think of, in the 1980s, um, British Petroleum, they have funded this whole thing about ecological footprint. Um, the study of how one's consumption affects the environment. So they made it very individual. And that's a way for people to dissuade them from politics of you know, mass pollution done by mass corporations. And unfortunately, the debate in Libya is a lot about turning vegan, turning, uh, you know, turning vegetarian or eating specific kind of organic food and whatnot. Uh, that's kind of culturally speaking. Uh, and that is the, a little bit like gardening without politics. Um, you know, a form of environmentalism um, that's happening. But on a large scale as a country, there isn't much, you know, um, debate about the, uh, the, the environment as a, oh, we need to cut down our emissions and whatnot. No. And um, this is actually what's even worse because of this. A year ago, the situation was, it still is um, economically horrible for people, literally destitution. The, the carbon filter in the car that once you, you know, use gas, there are particles that get produced in the air um, that are, uh, they cause cancer. There's a filter that has a lot of copper. And in the midst of pandemic, the copper was very expensive. And so people were actually taking that and selling it. And so we will see in the future, a lot of people in Libya getting cancer. And so there's this greed, uh, economic greed for, you know, in, uh, again, for, for the cost of, you know, cancer and whatnot. So that's, uh, that's kind of the more on an individual level what's happening in Libya when it comes to environmental issues. Um, yeah. Great, great, great answers from both of you. And uh, Professor, uh, Professor Campbell, I think very soon we need to get it to uh, get to one night where we just discuss the chat project. You need plenty of time to talk about it, but not tonight. I hope so. Hold on, on that. <laughs> It's a great topic. We can't just do justice to it in a few minutes. So with the few minutes left, I'm going to give you a big, 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 big question that has just come up. I thought there, I thought there were two questions in the chat, one from George that I don't think we answered. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the general view on Gaddafi? Do you, uh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Sam, go ahead and get to that in a few seconds. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so beyond the fact that a lot of people are nostalgic about, just like much of the Arab region with the Arab Spring, um, um, there is, you know, people realizing that it was all based on lies. Uh, the fact that there are actually no mercenaries that were used in Libya to kill Libyan people in protest, that not 10,000 people died in mass protests in Libya, only the whole uprising when the Al Jazeera and Arabia, they were saying 60,000 people have died. There were roughly uh, 5,000 in total. Um, still, that's a big number, and nobody should have died, and Gaddafi should not have used force against peaceful protesters. But lies and deceits have produced an image of Gaddafi being a tyrant, you know. Um, and all of the things that he predicted that will happen, they are happening right now. 
you know, tanks running in the street, you know, 15 year old, you know, instead of buying bread, you know, uses AK-47 to access, get bread. Um, and so all of these things, they were said in their speeches and they're coming true. And so they're saying, maybe we need to return to the past. And so, and that's why the old is dying and the new cannot be born. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, we cannot return to the past. We just have to learn from our mistake and turn back and learn that the West is the problem. The Western imperialism is the problem. Um, and who has this political project in Libya? So far, I don't know anybody uh, that actually, you know, a leading political figure who is saying that everybody is West, 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 West. But Isam, what we want to know is how many more like you are there in Libya? Among the Libyan students and PhD students and young Libyan leaders of the future, how many more do you belong to an intellectual community of Libyans who are thinking the way you're thinking? Yes, most of us are outside of Libya. Um, a lot of the youngsters, they're kind of are following the World Bank's logic of social entrepreneurialism, business driven, and so on and so on to kind of fix the social problems that exist. And I'm not saying that those things are bad, but that they're not a panacea. Uh, to structural problems. They're not a panacea to, you know, and they're not even a solution to the causes that have, you know, led to our, uh, the destruction of Libya. Um, so the, unfortunately there aren't, uh, I'm not saying that I'm special or anything like that, but uh, um, it's very specific path that I went to. And I think um, the education system uh, does not provide the opportunities that I have, have had, which is a very privileged opportunity. So um, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Let me take this opportunity to take this big question, okay? Uh, it's from Will. How would the U.S. administration and Western allies be held accountable for the destruction of Libya? Should they play an active role in its reconstruction and the reparation of the social, political, economic damage done, or should it remain a strictly Libyan affair? Should we solve our own problems, or the ones okay. that created the problem should be involved? Well, let me take a first go, and then I hope Isam will come in. First of all, the United States government can only be held accountable if we as intellectuals and students and workers and peace activists bring the question before the society, because the society has been persuaded that Gaddafi was about to kill his own people, and that the lies that Sarkozy presented were in fact true. So although Obama said that the intervention in Libya was the worst mistake of his presidency, Anthony Blinken, who is the Secretary of State for Biden, belongs to that group that have no remorse about going into Libya. That's the first. Secondly, Goldman Sachs, and Wall Street should be held accountable for what they've done in Libya. So that um, the Go Goldman Sachs and, um, and the, 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 the manipulation of the leaders of the Libyan Investment Authority. That's the second thing. Mm -hmm. The third thing is what was said by Isam, that this Miss Williams, who was the US representative on the United Nations mission to Libya, she was serving the interests of Trump and United Arab Emirates. And although the United States as a country signed the agreement about ceasefire, the United States as a country still had relationship with Prince, who is Eric Prince, the head of Black former Blackwater, who was involved in violating arms embargo. So there are many aspects of the peace process where the United States is criminally liable, but the liability is not brought forward because citizens, even the left in the United States of America, is not involved in raising these issues in Libya. Yeah, it has been great, great. But if there is just one last comment to that question that uh, Isam wants to bring out, and we apologize for going over time a little bit, but this is a great topic. We really need to get into it. 
So yeah, very briefly, uh, I was reading a book by Thomas Spoiler. He's a University of Illinois professor of law, and he he was um, hired by Gaddafi in 2007 to file a lawsuit against Italy in 2008, and uh, which for reparations for colonialism, which Italy uh, promised to pay 20 billion dollars uh, in investments mm -hmm. in Libya which have not yet been materialized yet. So again, 2008, 2011, Gaddafi was toppled. And so, and right now they're using the same logic as the unprecedented event, which is the Libyan Investment Authority. Libya does not have a functioning state, so we cannot do any business with it. And so again, you are, the destruction of Libya has saved the West a lot of money. Um, and, and so, and I think what this needs is that Libyans to, to realize that there is, you know, international law, there is something that we can use to, you know, fight the West and things like that. But, you know, when our politicians, they want to introduce, you know, Italian curriculum and French language, um, instead of, you know, strengthening the, strengthening the Arabic language in the curriculum or, you know, teaching Swahili or something. None of those things are being uh, questioned. So it's everything, everything is uh, Western centric, unfortunately. And these guys, all of them lived abroad. They have, you know, um, majority of the time in their life, they were in exile. And so now they're turned and they're trying to kind of import the logic of the West into Libya, unfortunately. So they're grateful that the West has toppled Gaddafi. Now they have their freedom to do what they want to do in a way. So that's kind of the situation, how it is. So it needs, a, again, Libya needs a new revolution, in my opinion, less bloody, less Western influenced, um, but then very Libyan centric, in my opinion. Great, I wanna thank everybody for your contribution, for your attendance and for your attention and for your commitment to study this topic a little further, because all of us are quite responsible for uh, the success of our continent. So Will and everybody that contributed questions, I really appreciate your contribution. And so if there are any final comments from our co-hosts, Mai and Jordan, uh, please go ahead and tell us uh, before we say bye to everyone. Okay, thank you, Dr. Toffee. Um, well, I want to thank you both Dr. Campbell and Isam for a very interesting talk. Um, I think you guys pointed to a lot of things in terms of what the diaspora should be aware of and how we should be thinking when looking at the news and when having these discussions about violence and the cycles of violence and the reproduction of violence. Um, and I think it was a great um, conclusion to our series this semester, um, the series of talks we've had um, and our focus has been on imperialism, it seems. And so I think this was a uh, timely and necessary. Um, so before I end, I see there are some comments and um, we are out of time. So everyone can go ahead and leave. But I think if anyone of our speakers, of course, are willing to stay back and anyone wants to continue the conversation, I would like to open that up. But if anyone has to go, I do want to thank everybody. I want to thank Malimu for the Africa Initiative, Dr. Coffee for participating and Isam, you too, for really being kind with your time even though it's Ramadan and you're fasting and the energy you provided is much needed. And also Jordan, who uh, helped me organize this. We did this together. So I want to thank everybody and open up some time for conversation and if anybody wants to continue. Of course we want to. Will does not have a complete answer to his question. So it's important that we said that clear. Is somebody, going, is somebody going to take responsibility for the mess they made? Rather what, than leave it to what us. do you see the oh, thing is? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, uh, just from what Isam and, and um, Dr. Campbell was saying, it, it seems like it's not like the West or the US or any of the other allies should be helping out, giving, you know, like, oh, we're here to clean up our mess kind of thing. It's more like justice should be brought in that rather they should be held accountable via international laws that are there to, to address these sort of you know, atrocities that they might have committed. That seems to be like, did I understand that correctly? From your both of your responses. Go um, ahead, Isam. Yes, um, just to kind of maybe highlight with an example, in 2011, in the 13th of July, um, NATO bombed Khwelde Al Hamedi. He's one of the close ties person to Gaddafi. Bombed his house, civilian house. 13 members of his family died. 
kids age of two, three, and four, and five, six, right? Um, and when the visuals were displayed of, you know, babies, you know, obliterated on, on the, the state TV, which was led by Gaddafi, the, the Al Jazeera Al Arabiya CNN, they said the Gaddafi regime is inhumane for showing these images to the public. You know, so there is that happening, you know, the war on Libya, that's what I think it's uh, good to highlight. But anyway, so now we we'll shift time a little bit forward. 2013, his son, uh, Khawad al-Ahmadi, his son is still alive and his family are still alive. They are trying to file a lawsuit against NATO. NATO has uh, international immunity. You cannot sue NATO. Um, and so any crime that NATO commits globally, there is no way of fighting it. And that has been, you know, part since then, uh, you know, 70 years ago when it started. Um, and so how could we fight that off? Um, you have, I have to study a lot to answer that. So, but I think there, there, is, there are people from the old regime who are trying to file lawsuits, but it's very individual based. It's not funded. You know, you need experts to find loopholes in the law to actually go against, you know, NATO destruction of Libya. If that answers your question. Yeah. That's good. So on the flip side, can I continue that? So how do we strengthen the AU? So if if we cannot maybe, you know, get together and sue NATO or stop or get into like that uh, arena, how to strengthen the AU? And is there? Well, I, I don't think the answer is strengthening AU. I think the answer is strengthening Isam and Mahi and that generation who will then strengthen each other so we'll have a different AU in the future. I think Mahi and Isam are the future of the AU. So <laughs> the question is, how do we strengthen um, Mahi and Isam? I, I, I can say personally, I'm, I'm so pleased that Isam came on our platform because you brought yeah. such refreshing um, um, urgency of what is happening to the Libyan people in this society. And I, I must um, appreciate, and I hope you write this up as a paper, try to get it published by third world quarterly or some other journal because it is very rich what you presented and we're going to have this on our website and we'll try to have a transcript on this also so um i, I want to encourage you in this direction of your scholarship because you have a firm foundation and you are you you you, you have the fact that your fingertips and the analysis and i was so pleased that you brought um Gramsci because that is where we are we, we want the new to be born in Africa, in the world, beyond neoliberalism. So uh, I, I, I just want to say, I'm just so pleased. As you're right, the Maximin Forte, I'm sorry he was not here, but I'm sure we're going to share the, um, the, 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 the recording with him. Let's go do that. Just, I just want to say thank you for your kind words, and I really do appreciate it, and for believing in the younger generation. So thank you. Thank you all for that. All right, I think I will bring this session to a close. Okay. And, uh, Good. Thanks once more to all our speakers and the organizers, and this has been very helpful. We'll see you all pretty soon. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Dr. Nice. Thank you. Isam, right. I have one question for you. You talked yeah. about Islamization happening. Is that push coming from the politicians, the current, like, um, and is it like, are there external forces supporting this kind of movement? And what you talked about also Saif al-Islam is the one who has the attention of the youth. Is, does he have those tendencies? You said he's Western educated, so maybe not. Just right. Um, so yeah, so let's start with Saif al-Islam. No, he does not have the Islamic, you know, uh, values much. I think um, he, he, he is, you know, soft power um, about, you know, talking and dialogue and things like that. So. Uh, he is not as feisty, let's use that word, as um, maybe his dad, uh, you know, Mama Gaddafi is. Um, so when it comes to the Islamization, if you think in 2000, in, in Libya, you know, from the 80s, 90s, there were Islamic factions that were actually militarized and they were not able to topple Gaddafi or assassinate him, right? Uh, and so they were put in jail. And then some of them actually fled the country to Afghanistan and fought. And they started what is commonly called the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. In 2011, um, a lot of them were flown back by the CIA to Eastern Libya. 
um, and they were handed weapons and training in the, in the camps in the east. And you know, and all of a sudden, in 2014, you, you have the Islamic State there. You have the beheadings. You have you know, and all of those things. But that is the radical faction. What is uh, what is the less the one that is kind of you know dressed up in a suit and tie, but then still espouses to political Islam is the, you know the Muslim Brotherhood. And they are the ones initially back in the 1930s. Yes, they were, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, socialist, um, you know, believing that uh, there's something pan about, you know, Islam. But now they have since 2009, I'm reading a book about Turkey, how it has shifted to complete neoliberalism model and also liking the West because the West has given them shelter from authoritarian governments, especially in UK and the United States. Um, and so those, how they have taken power, they, they have been sponsored, they get, you know, sanctuary in uh, Turkey, you, uh, in, the, in Qatar and in UK. Um, and when the election, they happen to get a lot of funding from those countries. And so they have been in power for, you know, uh, since 2012, technically. Um, when it comes to education system, when my time, when I was uh, during Gaddafi's time, um, it was, you know, Ottoman Empire was a bad thing. It was Libyan colonialism of some sort. Right now, it's the best time. It's the best expansions of Islam is the Ottoman Empire. And so that's one thing. The other thing is that there is nothing about, you know, Jamal Abdul Nasser, there's nothing about Gaddafi in the history and education textbooks, right? And why? Because they're the ones who actually have been against Muslim Brotherhood. They're, but then, you know, my issue with the silence of you know silencing history, you allow the the common sense of people, the the discourse in public sphere to take place instead of the education system, and that's kind of the scariest part. Because if you're not teaching people about their history, you will have un people don't know about anything about their identity. Why do they worship the things that they worship, and so on? And and that is just I'm I'm like very scared what the next generation will be who are you know 10, 15 years younger than me when the education system does not address these critical questions. So that's I think how Islamization has been happening. And there's also conservatism, you know, women should wear hijab and, and things like that in the street and so on, that I think other people could speak more about than I do because I haven't been there in, in a while. So yeah. Hopefully, sorry for the long answer, but yeah. No, no, I want um, a long, I want to do the contextualizer for me. So yeah. thank you. That was